turn your Bibles this morning over to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2. seven verses. They're well familiar to us. Uh, some can read every year at this time. Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse number 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Father, I ask your leadership with the message today, for it shall speak to our hearts, Lord, this morning. Lord, what a special time of year. And Lord, we ask now that our hearts would be tender, uh, Lord, to the, to the things of eternity, the things that are godly, and Lord, that we will not be overwhelmed by the things of the merchandising of this world uh, for Christmas, and that we will uh, keep our sights on you, glorify you, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, we, we talk about the celebration of Christmas, but for, for many people it's not a celebration, it's a very difficult time. I remember some years ago on Christmas Day sitting in a hospital uh, beside one of the uh, senior ladies at our church and uh, uh, as I sat there she was alone, there was no family there and so her and I spent Christmas Day right there sitting and chatting and praying together, reading scripture together that Christmas Day and it was a very special time. But uh, for a lot of people Christmas is about spending a lot of money going into debt, buying expensive gifts, so they can convince people that they don't even care about them, that they love them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you care about them, then you would do things throughout the year. Right. But sometimes people will go in hot, and they'll take all the rest of the next year just to pay off what they gave this year. And listen, Christmas is not about expensive Christmas presents. And I challenged the young people the other night that if you want to do something for your parents, if you just simply write out a piece of paper, I promise to wash the dishes every day for the next year. Your, your parents would probably think that's the greatest Christmas present you ever gave. I promise to vacuum the floor. I give That's my gift for you. You know, you can give yourself. You don't have to give money. And uh, so for some, the Christmas becomes about the gifts. For many businesses... You know, they start about September talking about uh, uh, Black Friday. And for many businesses, it's about as soon as Thanksgiving is over with, starting this Christmas shopping, and some people, they'll get out there before daylight. They're in line and get that, that one special toy that uh, nobody can remember what it was now after several years. Remember the Tickle Me Elmo? 
I don't even know what a tickle me elmo is. But I remember one year parents getting in line. We have to get we gotta get all the kids a tickle me elmo. Now you know where those are. They're in the landfill. That's where all those tickle me elmos are. Uh, now uh, Brother Kirk, all your, your boys are wanting now, that's what they want for Christmas, a tick in their yellow heart. But you understand, people wait in line to get a, get a, they think it's about that. It's not about that. It's not about Black Friday. I've often said businesses, listen, uh, if, if you have to t merchandise Christmas to survive, maybe you ought to figure out a new uh, business model. Mm -hmm. If you have to merchandise Christmas to survive. Yeah. And you understand, the, uh, Taking advantage of Christmas. Christmas is not about a sale at, at a department store. Christmas is not about bargains. And uh, and those who know me know I like bargains. And uh, it's not about bargains. It's not getting about getting good deals. It's not about any of that. I remember when I was a boy, we would travel up to Terre Haute, Indiana. Terre Haute was about 30 miles from where I grew up, and that was the big city to us. We only went there twice a year. And we would go up to do some uh, before school shopping to get school clothes, and then we'd go up there at Christmas time to do Christmas shopping. I had an aunt that uh, she loved Kmart in those days. The Blue Light Specials. Mm -hmm. Attention shoppers for five minutes only. Back in the knife section, we have cutlery uh, for, for a special deal. You can get two for the price of one. And my aunt looked like an Olympic hurdler. <laughs> She would jump over shopping carts, dive under shopping carts, crawl on her hands and knees under people to get that blue light special. And we would just crack it up. My family, we'd watch her. And she, as soon as, that, as, soon as that, they'd make the announcement on the PA, there she'd go, I'm looking for that bargain. And we would spend the day going into department stores. Now, it's the only time we ever went to department stores. And she was like our tour guide to us, do all the department stores and find all the bargains and all that. But that's not what Christmas is about. Now, there's some things about Christmas. Uh, I like the food. And uh, we used to have, we had unusual traditions as a boy. Uh, we, would, uh, we would eat, and then we would eat, and then we would eat for Christmas. Uh, somebody said, did you have uh, ham? Did you have turkey? Uh, do you have roast beef? And my answer would be yes. Uh, we did. We had all of it. And we would eat and eat and eat. And then we did something that uh, we had a family tradition that you folks here from the city will think this is weird. Thanksgiving, after we ate, we, the men all got together and went rabbit hunting. Every year on Thanksgiving. That was a tradition. And then for Christmas, after we ate, we all went deer hunting. And we would take, it was always, they would always try to get the boys to go and, and help, help, help the boys, the young guys to get a deer on Christmas Day. And it was always a big thing uh, with the men and traditions. Uh, you probably don't have that tradition, those of you who live in the city. Uh, but that's, that was the tradition we had as a boy. Uh, but that has nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, ham has nothing to do with Christmas, especially if you're Jewish, has nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, pumpkin pies, I love them, but it has nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, like that song, uh, give me a figgy pudding. Figgy pudding has nothing to do with Christmas. The food has nothing to do with it. If it did, some people would not be able to celebrate Christmas. Right. Because they don't have food. The truth is, we will throw away more food on Christmas Day than families around the world. Some of them will have to eat for the next month. And we're so blessed. But Christmas is not about the food. And sometimes it's about the get-togethers. So I know in our family, we would see cousins that we didn't see the rest of the year. And some of them, we were thankful for that. But uh, if you had a family like ours. And, but uh, Christmas was unique. I told you about the Christmases at my, my grandmother's house on Christmas Day. We would all gather over there. And uh, everybody would bring presents and they would exchange presents. But sometimes we never got to open the presents. Uh, on the way to grandma's house, my dad would sometimes say something like this, we may have to leave early. We said, why? He said, when the fight breaks out. It was not uncommon for somebody to get too liquored up at Grandma's house, and we would leave, and then uh, we wouldn't get our presents until later at Grandma's house because maybe somebody got in a fight about who was going to win a football game or something, and a, and a card table would go flying across the room with the food on it, and, and a couple grown men would be down in the middle of the floor wallowing around like hogs, fighting with each other. 
And my dad would say, all right, we're just not going to stay this year. And there were a couple years like that. We didn't get to stay. We left early because the fight broke out. Shameful things. Things that should not have any part to do with Christmas. I'm sure our police will be very busy at that time. Drunk drivers out on the road. Alcohol has nothing to do with Christmas. Nothing. It's very anti-Christmas. If somebody gives you a bottle of alcohol for Christmas, you know, there is a place for alcohol. It's called a drain. Put it down the drain. Uh, and uh, listen, uh, more people will have their Christmas ruined by, by a bottle of liquor than anything else I know. Men and women that normally will get along just fine, but because they've got liquor in their belly, will argue and fight and become shameful, especially at Christmas time. If, what is this thing about, though? If it's not about all that. And listen, I, I like the pretty decorations. I like the lights. When I was in Chicago, and I really recommend if you're ever in Chicago at Christmas time, to go down Michigan Avenue. The big stores on Michigan Avenue, the, the, the front windows on are as big as the side of this building, and they'll be fully decorated with animated things moving and all that, uh, with Christmas scenes. So it's, it's beautiful, all the bright lights and beautiful. Uh, and during the Christmas season in Chicago, I used to enjoy going down there and going over to Water Tower Place. Water Tower Place is a mall that's several floors high that has a, has a glass elevator that goes up with waterfalls on both sides. With all the beautiful Christmas lights and the Christmas music play and all that. It was just a beautiful thing and the smell of food. You know, some of the uh, sweet candies, cooking and baking, been baked and all that. And boy, and going up there, well, that was neat. But you know what? None of that has anything to do with Christmas. Somebody said, well, the big jolly red man, the man in the red suit's coming. Mm -hmm. We were over to, through the mall. We hardly ever go to the mall, but we were in there, I forget, looking for something the other day. And uh, that uh, little stand in the middle where the jolly man in the red suit's supposed to be, he wasn't there. And there was some very large obese man who was just sitting up there with, looked like his kids had come up there and he was just talking to them. And I thought, what is this, bring your own Santa? And, <laughs> uh, but listen, it's not about that. It's not about those. Uh, we, in fact, I used to have a song that would get in trouble every year because he'd get up and read the songs and he said, we're not going to sing about Satan Claus this year. And boy, some people would get offended at that. Every year, I would get here about for several weeks afterwards. And you tell him to stop that. And you tell him to quit that. He did it every year. If I talked to him, he'd do it next year again. And time and time again. It's not about a man in a red suit. In fact, much of that's blasphemous. If somebody, if there's somebody who sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been good or bad, then call the police. Because you have a peeping Tom. <laughs> Seriously. Why is that excusable? Only God knows when you're sleeping and when you're awake. Only God. And what they're saying that that man is omnipotent. And omnipresent. That's blasphemy. Only God is omnipresent. And uh, omniscient. And listen, we don't want to give that to anybody. Even the devil's not that. And we understand. Listen. When, you, when you, your parents sacrifice to buy you a gift, that's who you ought to be thanking. The ones that love you, that are real, that care about you. But that's not what Christmas is about. Uh, some of us, some, some of you don't even have a chimney. You've got a little gas furnace, and boy, I really feel sorry for your house. That's why I guess you're not getting any presents this year. All right? <laughs> you understand? You just understand how far-fetched some of this is. <laughs> And almost caused us to lose the value of Christmas and the importance of it. I want to talk to you about the wonderful story of incarnation today. The wonderful story of Christmas. The real story of Christmas. What is it really about? Well, the story of Christmas, you have to begin many years before Jesus was born and laid in a manger. The story of Christmas begins all the way back uh, with God using a man named Micah. Micah was a prophet of God. 
In Micah one day, God spoke to him in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, the ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And so Christmas begins with the very proclamations of ancient prophets. You see, it was prophesied. Everything about Him coming into the world was prophesied. One of the greatest proofs that you have in your hand, a book that's God's book, is Bible prophecy. And we ought to be aware of the Bible prophecy in this book because it's proof. This is not like any other book. This book that calls things to, to your attention that have, do not happen many times for hundreds of years later. And this book that predicts them accurately. You say, well, all religions have their prophecy. Yes, but they, their prophecies are not true. They don't really happen unless you have a vivid imagination. You know, there's a man named Nostradamus. That some people want to say, well, he was a prophet. Well, Nostradamus, what he would do, he'd, he'd breathe in smoke. You know, put your mouth over a garbage can and suck in some smoke. And believe me, you'll see visions too. And he would see things. And after he saw these things, he would write them down. And on one occasion, he wrote some things down. And, and somebody said, and, uh, and uh, he, 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 it, it looked like almost like the word Hitler. And so he was prophesying Hitler. It wasn't even the word Hitler. And, uh, but, but it was similar to that. And so people begin to try to use their imagination. You don't have to do that with the Bible. What it says, it says and means what it means. You don't have to twist it. You don't have to distort it. Uh, how about that prophecy that, of, of the virgin birth of Christ? The Bible said back there uh, when, when Eve sinned that one day the seed of the woman is going to come and crush the serpent's head. Hey, the seed of a woman? That never happened before. And yet, only, only happened one time because everyone else is the seed of man except for Jesus Christ who came to crush the serpent's head. And we find He was promised to be of the seed of Abraham in Genesis 12.3. He was promised to be the seed of Isaac in Genesis 17. He was promised to be the seed of Jacob in Genesis 28. He would be of the family of David and tribe of Judah according to Genesis 49. He would be a prophet according to Deuteronomy 18.15. He would be the eternal heir to David's throne according to 2 Samuel chapter 7. He would be God's son according to 2 Samuel 7.14. He would be God. Actually God in the flesh. Isaiah 9.6. The time of His coming was specified. He would be cut off 490 years after the order to rebuild Jerusalem and it God gave the timetable and Jesus came into the world according to His divine timetable. He would be out of Israel, Numbers 24, 17. He would be born in Bethlehem as we read in Micah 5, 2. And He would be born of a virgin. Hey, that's just a few of the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Nobody else could fulfill the prophecies. If somebody set out, planned it, said, I'm going to fulfill the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ, how would you do it? How would it ever be possible? You'd have to plan your own birth. You, somebody said, well, Jesus manipulated those things. Uh, uh, and they'll quote such things in Matthew where it says uh, that, that it might be fulfilled. And I heard somebody say, well, that means that Jesus did these things so the prophecy would be fulfilled. No, that's not what it's saying at all. Because how can you have a virgin birth and that, that, that would try on purpose so that you could fulfill a prophecy? How can be a born a seed of a woman and plan that to be fulfillment of a prophecy? Jesus didn't do these things to fulfill prophecy. The prophecy was stated beforehand and it was fulfilled in what He did. Nobody else could fulfill the prophecies. Nobody else could be the Christ. There are people today who say Jesus was just a good man. And, all he, and else they want to emphasize His teachings. And so, well, you know, we want to look at the teachings of Jesus. In fact, probably most of the churches around Frederick this morning, they believe Jesus was a good man and He brought about good teachings. But Jesus didn't come into the world to be a good teacher. He came into the world to be the perfect Savior. And you understand, did He teach good things? How could anything but good come from Him? If He's teaching, if He's speaking, whatever He's doing, how could anything but good come from Christ? But that's not his primary purpose. He came to die. I saw a painting some years ago. I don't know who painted it. I have not seen it since. But I, I saw a, a print of this painting. It showed uh, the manger scene. And then the, 
uh, back in the background, it showed uh, the, a star, and that star was shining in such a way that it, from the from the manger, it cast a shadow on the ground, and the shadow on the ground was in the shape of the cross. You see. Everything from the time Jesus came into this world was about one thing. It was about that cross. To go to that cross. To die on that cross. To, to pay our sin debt on that cross. Everything. That, you see, He wouldn't come to glorify the manger. He came to glorify the cross. And He was not about uh, the, uh, the, the uh, stable. He was about Calvary. That was the message of Christ. And fulfillment of prophecy points to the real Christmas story. The real Christmas story. Secondly, it not only involved ancient prophecy, it involved the humility of a stable. We start to think about how Jesus came into this world. Luke chapter 2 verse 4, the verses that we read, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because of the house and lineage of David. Notice, he had to go there and to pay their taxes, and he was there. Uh, it, very poor family. Uh, and and uh, here he comes. Uh, Joseph brings his family, and Mary gives birth to him, in the Lord Jesus, in a stable, because what? There was no room for them in the end. There was no room for him, uh, because all the people had gathered around at this decree. They all had to travel. All those that were of the lineage of David had to go to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. And so people from all over the empire had to come there to that place physically to pay their taxes. They, they, they didn't drop it in the mail. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't have it wired. They, they, they couldn't get on the phone and, and give them their credit card number. They had to literally, physically travel to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. And so all the people were gathered there. And I don't think it has anything to do with the cruelty of the of the people, the places, the places were packed. The place was full of people, and so the only place that they could find for, for Joseph to take Mary was a stable. At the end, he went to the end, but they didn't have any room there. But there at the stable. Now we don't know all the details. I've, I've read several different theories about that stable, that place, and uh, some of the things that have been. Uh, some of the new revelations about that as folks have been studying it's been kind of interesting but uh, you know sometimes our tradition takes over and we quit researching the biblical uh, things that are taught to us but we understand uh, it was in a stable now I've spent a lot of time around stables and uh, they are not exactly sterile like a hospital they're just not uh, you know you usually have them a little older in the air and it's not bread baking in the oven. Alright? Uh, and there's, you know, and it's, they, they, it's a place that's smelly. It's a place where, where animals uh, defecate and eat. It's a place of, uh, that, that, that's there. And you, and you have in the stable usually some old rags. Because if you're working with livestock and things, sometimes you get some of that stink on your hands. Constantly. Wipe off your hands. That's what it said. She took swaddling clothes and laid them in. The only thing she could find to wrap the body of our Lord Jesus in were the rags that you'd find around the stable. Now we can glorify that. You know, there were no pampers. Now when my kids were growing up, some of you remember, we didn't have pampers either. Uh, somebody said the other day, what, how did you put diapers on them? You'd take the diapers and you recycle <laughs> Remember when we used to really recycle? Mm -hmm. You reused the diaper. Yep. You would empty the diaper. Of course you'd empty the diaper. And then you would wash the diaper. Yep. And then uh, you would re-diaper the kid with the same diaper. A clean. That's been washed. So, oh, I can't imagine putting that same diaper on there again. Well, we did it over and over. There were no pampers. <coughs> you know what? People who talk about recycling, most of them use pampers. Yep. And it's all oh, we're filling our landfill. Then quit buying pampers. But it's it shows the hypocrisy of all that stuff. Uh, and uh, you remember back before we had plastic bottles to get our water in? Yeah. Plastic bottles everywhere. Uh, oh, never mind. That's another rabbit trail. But uh, <laughs> but born to a poor family. The the humility of a stable. Now my parents didn't have much. 
We were poor. We didn't, I didn't know we were poor, but we lived in an old house, several old houses that uh, my dad would make arrangements with the landlord to let us live there for free. And dad would work on the old house and fix it up. And when we first moved in there, there would sometimes be rats, snakes, and we had a number of occasions where dad, where dad would bring a snake out of the house and throw it out of the house. Uh, one night, mom had a, had a spell. She came running into the living room screaming and hollering, and, and while she was doing dishes, a black snake had come down and looked at her eyeball to eyeball while she was doing dishes. Now, my dad, the brave man that he was, went and got the shotgun and shot it in the cabinet with the dishes. It did not only destroy the snake, it destroyed the dishes and the wall behind the dishes. And so we had a window where we never had one before. Uh, but, uh, but we had, we finally we'd get the snakes all out and I can remember, I can remember laying in bed and when we got all the snakes out of the house, hearing them trying to gnaw through the floor while you was trying to sleep. <laughs> trying to get in. So I know a little bit about poor. I know about nailing tin can lids on holes in the floor. Shoving newspapers in the wall. I used to say that mom would get up and shit sweep the snow off the linoleum floor. Then I recalled one day we didn't have a linoleum on our floors. And, uh, but she would sweep it off, shove some newspapers in the holes in the wall. I know all about that stuff. I, when people talk about poor, I, I know a little bit about that, but I know I, as poor as we were, not me, not my two brothers, not my sister. My mother did not give birth to us in the barn. As poor as we were. Didn't happen. But Joseph and Mary were poor. And we find that Christmas, the true message of Christmas is a message of encouragement to the poor. I know some people, they become suicidal after the holidays. Every year about this time, there's a surge of suicides in the next few weeks. I pray it's not that way this year. But it usually is. It's because people, some people, had as big plans of what their Christmas was going to be. And because maybe their finances, or maybe family relations, or for some reason or another, Christmas did not live up to their expectation. Then after Christmas, they fall into deep depression and do not want to live. Christmas had the opposite effect it was supposed to have upon them because it became about, uh, their Christmas was a Christmas only for people who have money. Listen, Christmas ought to be an encouragement to poor people. God loves the poor. And He cares about the poor. The true meaning of Christmas can be celebrated when you have absolutely no money in your pocket. The true meaning of Christmas can be celebrated when you don't even have a roof over your head. The true meaning of Christmas can be celebrated when you may not even be able to find enough food to eat that day. The true meaning of Christmas has nothing to do with it. It has to do with Christ who humbled Himself. Imagine, Jesus from eternity to eternity is God. Imagine, he, He's in heaven. He has the wealth of heaven. He has the grandeur of heaven. And then, suddenly, born into this world through a virgin's womb, He comes into this world. Think of it now. Now, He humbles Himself to poverty to live in this world. Now, most of us would say, well, we're not middle class or somewhere. But if you suddenly were brought so low that you gave birth to your children in a barn, that would be humiliating for you, wouldn't it? But think of it for Christ who came all the way from heaven to that humiliation. Who came where the streets are of gold. Where angels gather around and praise you and worship you down to be born into a filthy, stinking barn laid in a manger. A manger is where you put the animals' feed to eat. It's where the animals eat. And that was used as a crib. For the Lord Jesus. And then they took some of those old rags off hanging on maybe on a nail on the wall over there that you'd wipe your hands on in the barn and used them for diapers and wrapped his little body. They used them for blankets to wrap this little body. That is coming down as low as you can go in society. That's how low Jesus came. Oh, listen, the real story of Christmas involves the humility of a stable. Just a humble stable. 
And our Lord, that's consistent with all our days in the poor family, born in the stable, laid in the manger, and he made his living as an adult. That's a simple tradesman, a carpenter. Number three, the real Christmas, the true Christmas, not only involves the fulfillment of ancient prophecy and the humility of a stable, it involves the announcement of angels. Angels were involved, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Notice uh, the announcement of these angels. Notice when the angels appeared, the shepherds were afraid. The shepherds, if you saw an angel today, uh, unless that angel took on the bodily form of a man, and sometimes they do, they'll take on the appearance of, of a male, a man. And uh, the Bible says sometimes we may entertain angels unaware. But unless that angel took off on that form and you saw them, it would flat scare you to death. Frightening. And we know that there was angels in the Old Testament that wiped out whole armies. One angel wiped out an entire army. These are uh, powerful beings created by God as His messengers primarily from, from heaven to earth. They're not little passive beings. They're warlike beings. And here, the shepherds saw them. It says, they, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. Somebody said, what's sore afraid mean? That means they're so afraid it hurts. I mean, sore afraid. I mean, I just scared to death as we would say in our own vernacular today. But notice the message. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. What is the highest glory of God? Salvation. That's the highest glory of God. You know, sometimes uh, so these television preachers, they'll talk about, well, you know, God caused this person's leg to grow back and this arm. You know, they never have anybody so they grew a second head or anything like that. But they'll have all these things. And they'll think that brings glory to God. The greatest glory that God gives is when a sinner says, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. God gets more glory than from, from healing lame uh, and to touching blinded eyes. And he gets more glory when a sinner calls upon Him. That's the, that's the glory to God in the highest. And notice the, the peace from God that comes to earth. You know, they did a study some years ago. A, a university did studying the history of war. And studied history of war throughout human civilization. And going back as far as they had written records tracing wars. All the way back, as far as the records would go until the present day, they found, as far as they know, they don't know for sure if there was a war taking place, but documenting it, they only found 14 years they could not document that there was a war taking place in the world. There are always wars in the world. There's fighting. There's killing. It is one of the characteristics of a sinful world. There's full, there are wars. But what did the angel say? Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. So I said, well, there's proof the Bible can be true because there is no peace on earth. Oh, yes, there is. There is peace on earth, but it's in the heart of the believer. Peace came down the night I called upon Jesus Christ to save me. For the first time in my life, I had peace on earth. Peace comes into the heart of everyone who's called upon Christ. Peace on earth. It's a reality of those who know Christ. It is not a reality of those without Christ. This is a dangerous world to those who do not know Christ. But there's peace in the heart of the believer. I always think about when our Lord Jesus stood on that boat. And the waves were beating against him. The disciples were, were all frantic. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Jesus stands up and says to those waves, Peace. 
Be still. And those waves like a little puppy curled up at his feet. Calm. Suddenly, it was gone. The storm was over. And how many times in our hearts when we called upon him and he says, peace, be still. And he's calmed the storms in our life. There is peace on earth, but it is not for those who do not know him. But there is peace on earth in the hearts of those who know him. Peace that comes from God to earth. And he said, goodwill toward me comes from God. Some of you remember that, little, that old uh, movie years ago with Jimmy Stewart. It was a wonderful life. And I, think, I don't know if it's been on this year or not, but uh, usually it's on several times. And, uh, where, uh, and at one point in, uh, in the film, he says, it would have been better off if I'd never been born. And so he is taken to the place to see what the world would be like if he had never been born. You know, that may be true for some of us. We go through life. Maybe it wouldn't have made that much a difference if you and I had never been born. But I'll tell you one thing. It made a big difference when Jesus was born. Even in the most wicked societies, it made a difference. You know, most hospitals were started by Christian people. Do you understand education was started by Christian people? The unsaved atheists never started schools. They take them over after they're started. Uh, and they, they don't start schools. They don't. You, see, you understand that education was founded for the very purpose so people would know how to read the Bible. That's why education was started. That's why, did you know that's why the education in America was started? So people could know how to read the Bible. If you take the Bible out, there's no need for the education. See, education is not, it's not in place for you to make a better living or you to make more money. That's not what education is about. Education is about knowing God more so that you can do His will more. And you can have His blessings more. But the world, it, it's all about the brotherhood of man. We've got to learn to be good to each other. Listen, they missed the whole point. The reason people are good to each other is because God has been good to them. People can pump it up and be kind to each other for a little while, but it's all fake. Even the good things that people do for each other that are not saved is hypocritical. It's done because the Bible says even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Filthy rags? Filthy rags? My righteousness is no better than the rags ever used to wrap the body of that little baby Jesus. That's my righteousness. That's the good things I've done. Hey, that's what I gave. Uh, that's when I gave to the poor. That's when I threw that nickel in there for the Salvation Army. That's when I, that's what that was. Before I was saved, all that, God says, was just filthy, dirty rags, just like the ones used to wrap the body of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was laid in the manger. That's my righteousness. That's the good things. But you understand, uh, and, and I'm so thankful when people do good things, but, but the truth is if I knew their motive, the unsaved world does good things to be seen of men. See how nice I am. Their favorite song is how great I am. And it's all about them. See what I did. See what I've done. Uh, you know, uh, they get offended when they do something and they're not shown attention for it. Well, how come you didn't notice what I did? Because it was all about them. It wasn't about helping anybody, meeting the need. But see, with our Lord Jesus coming into the world, when we know Him, we have glory to God in the highest. We have salvation. We have peace from God that comes to earth. And we have goodwill toward men. But it comes from God. It may flow from another human being, but it comes from God. You've all heard the story about a lady some years ago, a single mother had two or three children, lived in a little apartment complex. They, the walls of the apartment complex were rather thin, so you could hear everything that happened in one apartment and the next uh, adjoining apartment. Well, this, this lady was a Christian, and she was trusting God and praying to God to help her raise her children uh, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, uh, and, and right next to her apartment was an atheist in his apartment. 
And he could hear her over there praying sometimes, uh, pleading with God to, to provide groceries and provide food, help her with rent money. And he could hear her over there. And every time that she'd get a prayer answered, she would come knocking on his door. So I just want you to know, I know you say there's no God, but God met my needs today. And God took care of me. And she would go over there and with that, and he just thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach her a lesson. So the atheist heard her over there one day with just pleading with God, saying, oh, God. I don't have any money to buy food. I don't have food to feed my children. And I need money to buy food. I need to be able to buy some food. And, and the atheist heard and said, I'm going to teach her a lesson. He said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go down to the market and I'm going to buy some groceries. And I'm going to sneak in her back door and I'm going to put those groceries on her kitchen table. And I know immediately now, after hearing her to pray over that, she's going to come over and knock on my door and tell me God gave her those groceries. And I will tell her, God didn't do it, I did it. And I'll teach her, it's not God that's meeting your needs, it's, it's people who meet your needs. And so, sure enough, he went down there, market, bought the groceries, snuck in her back door, put them on her kitchen table, snuck out the back door, and in a little while he could hear her over there, Glory to God! Hallelujah! I mean, she was having a hallelujah fit over there. And sure enough, he heard the, the, her door open up and close, and he heard her steps coming down the hallway and coming up to his door. And he went to the door, and she said, You're only saying there is no God. I just want you to know, a little while I prayed for groceries, and God brought groceries on my kitchen table. There are groceries. God answered my prayer. And he said, Ma'am, I want to teach you a lesson. God did not give you those groceries. I did. I brought that to you. I took care of that. And just to prove to you it wasn't God. That's why I did it. And she said, Glory to God. Hallelujah. And he says, Now why are you shouting hallelujah and glory to God for? I told you I brought the groceries. She said, Sir, I believe God gave me those groceries even if he used the devil for the delivery boy. And listen, <laughs> God takes care of you. It's God who meets your needs. We need to remember that goodwill toward men comes from God. It may flow through a human being, a human vessel, but it's from God. All good things come from God. And so we find it involved the announcement of angels. Then, number four, it involved the faith of shepherds. Luke chapter 2, verse 15, And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto me. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I want to challenge you today. Do you have room for Jesus? Do you have room for Jesus in your heart and in your life? You so say, I've got my life planned out, but does it center around Jesus? Or is it about you? It's about your goals, what you want. Or is it about Christ? Every year, I, at some point, tell this old story, and I'll close my message with it today. And uh, Years ago, a church where I pastored, where well, I was assistant pastor, actually, uh, we had a very large youth group. I was in charge of our teenagers. Can you imagine, you teenagers, look up here. Imagine, we had like 30 or 40 teenagers in our church. And I worked with the teens. And at Christmas time one year, we, we exchanged names and we had a Christmas party. And everyone changed the name, whoever's name you get, you've done that before, and going shopping, and get a present for them. So at our Christmas party, we did that that year. Well, it just so happened in that church, we had some very poor people, and then we had some pretty wealthy people. Uh, let me tell you about, let me, I mean, these are not the real names. I changed the names on purpose. I want to tell you about Joe. Joe and his three brothers, they were very poor. They didn't have a house or family, didn't they? They had some old abandoned house trailers that they pulled into a cow pasture side by side. There was some distance in between them, so they just put a plank down so you could walk from one into the other. It was muddy around their house. I remember I drive them in the van to pick them up uh, on Sunday night to pick them up for church, and I'd have mud all over the van time I got there to pick them up. They owned very little. Living out in the middle of a cow pasture in old abandoned house trailers. 
that's where Joe lived. We also had a family in our, there that was quite wealthy. That uh, the father was a businessman, very well respected in the area. They had whatever whatever money could buy. They had they had a beautiful home. They had beautiful things. Uh, the interesting thing was when they drew names for prizes, uh, Joe, the poor boy, drew the name of Bill, the, the boy from the very wealthy family, to get him a present for the Christmas party. But what made it more interesting is that Bill got Joe's name. And so he was to get a present for him for the Christmas party. Well, when, when Joe went home, he didn't have any money, and we had told him to make it a $5 limit. We don't want anybody spending a lot more than that on the presents, but a $5 limit. And Joe went home, and he's looking around, and he didn't have $5. And so he decided he would go around to all the neighbors and see if there was any work he could do to try to earn $5 to get a $5 gift for the Christmas party. And he went to all the neighbors, and, and nobody really needed any help, and, and he came home discouraged with no money. His heart was broken. He wanted to go to the Christmas party with the other kids, but he didn't have five dollars for the gift. Now, when, when Bill went home, he just handed that little piece of paper to his mom and said, "Mom, I need a, I need a gift for the Christmas teen Christmas party." And his mom said, "I'll pick up something." And so he didn't even think about it anymore after that because his mom was going to give a gift, and she would just go down to the store and buy something. Well, what happened was that uh, Bill's mom went and bought. A Swiss Army knife. I don't mean one of these, the fake ones. I mean expensive, more than five dollars. Beautiful Swiss Army knife. She knew that would be something that that Joe would like, and uh, so she got him that beautiful Swiss Army. That's one of those you know to have a spoon and a fork, kitchen sink on it, refrigerator, and all. I mean, it's got all kinds of little gadgets that you can pull out of there. And so she went out, bought that, put it in a box, and wrapped it up with beautiful paper. Well, they got closer and closer to the Christmas party. And Joe did not have anything. He did not have five dollars. So he came up with another plan. He said, well, what I will do, since I don't have five dollars, I can't go buy anything, I will take the most, the most valuable thing that I own, and I will wrap it up and give it as my gift. Well, he didn't have anything. The only thing that he could think of that he had of any value, his brother had gone to a yard sale, and bought an old plastic robot. Now, this is something really the smaller kids would have been playing with, but it's the most valuable thing he had. This plastic robot that his brother had got for him. It was one of those that you put the batteries in it, you know, and it had lights that would flash, and it would go into the wall and turn around, and then go back the other way. Well, it had quit doing that a long time ago. The back on the held the batteries on it was missing. One arm was missing off of it. It was just an ugly sight with a broken arm, no longer held it, held any batteries, but he said, it's the most valuable thing I own. And he said, I'm going to give the most valuable thing I own. And he took that old broken robot, and he didn't have any gift wrapping paper, so he found some old newspapers. And he wrapped that old broken robot in some newspapers. He didn't have some scotch tape, he found some duct tape. And he wrapped it up the best he could, and they, we had the Christmas party. They had the gifts under the tree. And you know how teenage girls are. They're fussing and fighting. We want to pass out the gifts. Can we pass out the gifts? And finally, they said, on what girls were going to pass out the gifts. And so, they, uh, as they're passing them out, they picked up one. And it had Joe's name on it. And they take it over and hand to Joe. And he opens up and there's that Swiss Army knife. Man, he just gleamed. I mean, it was, he looked at that. He was so excited seeing that beautiful Swiss Army knife. And he was so proud of it, going around showing him, look what I got, look what I got. And then they reached down there and found just a lump of stuff wrapped with newspaper. They took it over and gave it to Bill. Bill began to tear the newspaper off of that old broken down robot. He opened it up. And this is a boy who had family had money to buy anything and everything he ever wanted throughout life. And he looked at that robot missing one arm. No, nothing to hold the batteries in the back of it. And he made this statement, who gave me this junk? Well, it was kind of obvious. He looked around and there was a big old boy, and uh, Joe was a big old boy. I mean, he's, he was tall, had big broad shoulders. It's pretty obvious who had given him the gift because that big old boy, his lower lip began to quiver. 
water begin to swell up in the corner of his eyes. And I saw him turn his back to the rest of the kids, and he, he left the living room where we were, went out through the kitchen, and went out on the back porch of the deck they had back there, and he just looking off out on that with tears streaming down his cheeks. I followed him out the back door, put my hand on his shoulders, and I said, Joe, it's all right. He made this statement. He said, he just doesn't understand. He just doesn't understand. I gave him the best I had, but it wasn't enough. I gave him the best I had, but it wasn't enough. You know, I thought about that so many times after that. While the whole world has their Christmas, it's about the lights, the decorations, and the food, and, and all that. Very little about Jesus. I wonder if God Almighty looks out of heaven and says, I gave you the best I had, but it wasn't enough. I gave you my own son, but it wasn't enough for you that you have substituted the Christmas other than what I gave you when I gave you my own blessed son. I gave you my best, but it wasn't enough. Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Was what God gave you enough? Are you here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Why not? After God gave so much for you. Gave His own dear Son for you. Why isn't that enough? For you to call upon God and trust Him as your Savior. Maybe you're here today and you are saved. But if you get all tangled up in the things of this world and our, and our priorities get out of whack and our values get out of whack and you may need to once again go to God and say, God, I need to make Jesus priority again. Make Him the Lord of my Christmas. And not all these things that pull and tug at my heart. I need to make Jesus Lord. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I wanted somebody today here to say, you know, I really need the Lord. I'm not saved. I don't want another Christmas. It's just the material things, the, the pretty paper that will be thrown in the trash in a few days and, and all the decorations that will be gone in a few days. I want something everlasting in my heart. I need Jesus Christ. Please pray for me. If I die right now, I don't know for sure to go to heaven, but I want to know. Please pray for me. Is there anybody like I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to remember you in my prayer. Pray for me. I need the Lord. I don't know that I'm saved. But I need the Lord. Pray for me. Anybody at all? all? Right, let me ask you this. If you know you are saved today and you know you're going to heaven because you've trusted Christ as your Savior, is Jesus enough for you? Is He is your Christmas centered around Christ in your family, in your plans, or is it all about the material and so little about Jesus? All about the things of this world and not about Jesus. Maybe you need to ask God to help you to keep Christ the center of your Christmas as we pray today. Our Father, now we have this invitation. We pray now that you would draw us to you, Lord. Help us to see that Jesus should be enough. All such love, such grace bestowed through him. May we love him like we ought to, serve him like we ought to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, heads bowed, and eyes closed.